Hi everyone, I want to remind you where we left off in the previous video. I stop at this example because I said I'm going to actually work it out in the separate video and here's where I'm going to do this particular example. Um, the example is asking you to compare the relative lattice energy strength between two different ionic compounds and there are two questions here, A and B. I'm actually going to work on question B. I'm going to leave question A for you to work through and they'll be asked in a questionnaire that accompanies this video so you should think about the same concepts that I would talk about in, in question B would basically apply to question A as well and so I want you to apply those concepts there. Um, <clears throat> remember that the important uh, equation to keep in mind here is Coulomb's equation so we're gonna start with that in the uh, scratch paper right here. So um, we're trying to compare these two ionic compounds and uh, we're going to look at Coulomb's equation to do that. And remember Coulomb's equation so the potential energy between two interacting charges is going to be uh, K uh, constant times Q1, Q2 over R. We're really only going to focus on the terms there in the parentheses. So I'm going to rewrite this equation this way where I'm going to use a proportionality instead. So potential energy is going to be just proportional to Q1, Q2. Uh, uh, over R, where Q1 is charge of cation, Q2 charge of anion, R is the char uh, distance separating the two ions, okay, or the uh, basically the ionic bond distance. So if you want to compare the strength of ionic bonds between these two species, CaCl2 and MgF2, what you have to do is for each species analyze the Q1, Q2, and R, and basically compare them to each other and see which one dominates more. Okay, if you think about this factor before we actually go ahead and kind of compare these in terms of numbers, let's just think about this real quickly first, okay? This potential energy would be larger if Q1, Q2 is larger because that's in the numerator and R is smaller, right? So in other words, PE would be large if Q1, Q2 is large and R is small, okay? So that's what you want to keep in mind when comparing these two numbers. Now we're going to actually compare the two numbers, okay? So for CaCl2, the Q1, which is the charge of the cation, is plus 2. The Q2, which is the charge of the anion, is negative 1, okay? Because it's a minus 1 ion. For MgF2, Q1 is also plus 2 because magnesium is a plus 2 cation. And Q2 is also negative 1 because fluoride is a negative 1 anion. So in other words, from the perspective of charges, these two ionic compounds have exactly the same strength. Okay? As a result, we have to look at the distance. Now here's where that table of ionic bond radii that I showed you in a couple of videos ago becomes important. So remember I talked about this whole concept about isoelectronic series and the fact that you have a noble gas in the middle and then you have things that get bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of uh, anion, right? Negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and then this is the noble gas, okay? And then we get cations on this side and they get smaller and smaller and smaller because there um, they're are a lot more protons than electrons in this case. So this would be the plus 1, the plus 2, and the plus 3 cation that are all of these isoelectronic with the noble gas. Let me just remind you what that thing looks like, which is here in this slide. Okay, so remember first I show you this slide where I talked about the differences in the sizes due to the different numbers of protons and electrons, and I actually show you this slide where it actually shows the exact uh, radius of these ions, uh, uh, radius of these ions. So for example, these are all ions that are isoelectronic with neon and you can see that uh, the nitride ion for example it's 171 this units are in picometers and then you can see something like aluminum 3 plus is actually 50 uh, picometer in terms of its radius okay so the information provided in this slide becomes useful when we're trying to estimate that distance uh, factor in the um, ionic bond in the Coulomb in Coulomb's equation And the reason is the following, because if you think about R, which is, remember, a distance between the two ions, if you think about it, the ionic compound looks like this, right? So let's say this is my uh, anion on one side, this is the negative, and this is the positive. 
the distance is really just the distance between this uh, nuclei and this nuclei, this nucleus right here. So it's that distance right there. Well, how is that distance uh, computed? Well, if you think about it, it's just the sum of this distance, which is the radius of the cation, plus this distance, which is the radius of the anion. Okay. So in other words, R here is just the sum of the radius of the cation plus the radius of the anion. Well, that table that I just showed you give you the distances. So in other words, you can use those to estimate, you know, what is the factor, what is this R factor, and compare it for the two ionic compounds that we want to look at, which is CaCl2 and MgF2. Now, specifically for these two, it's actually not important to know the actual numbers. And I'll tell you why. So CaCl2, if if we want to know R, basically what we need to look at is, well, what is the size of the cation? Uh, with respect to each other, okay, which one is the bigger one, which one is the smaller one? Well, if we look at the periodic table, Mg2 plus is above Ca2 plus, right? Because that's in the periodic table, Mg is higher than Ca. That means, of course, that the R for Ca2 plus is bigger than the R for Mg2 plus. If you look for, in comparison now, for the anion component, F minus and Cl minus, you notice that they have the same pattern in this case, where R of uh, Cl minus is bigger than the R of F minus, okay? So when I take these factors combined together, I see that Ca and Cl are combined together, and both of them are bigger, respectively, than their corresponding cation anion in the other ionic compound. So I can clearly say in this case that the distance, the ionic bond distance of CaCl2 would be bigger than the ionic bond distance of MgF2. Okay, how is that going to do to their potential energy? Well, the equation is Q1, Q2 over R. So if R is big, the potential energy becomes smaller, right? That's what I said earlier. So as a result, you can pause the video if you want to look back at what I said earlier, but that's what you know we, we, we decided earlier. So as a result, in this case, if R is bigger for CaCl2 and then the Q1, Q2 in this case are the same, that means the R is the only factor that matters. So then the potential energy, therefore, for CaCl2, in this case, as an absolute value, I want to put this as an absolute value, must be smaller than the absolute value of the potential energy for MgF2, okay? Now I want to point this out. Why do I want to use absolute value? Because Q1 times Q2 is a negative number, okay? So I don't want you to kind of get confused with, well, you know, if it's a smaller negative number, doesn't mean, doesn't that mean that it's a bigger number? So I don't want you to get, kind of get into that kind of confusion with math. So in this case, we're saying basically the absolute value of this number, whatever this number is, is going to be less than the absolute value of this number. Uh, of course, that's also the lattice energy. So if you want to write it in terms of lattice energy, you can just say the lattice energy of the lattice energy of CaCl2 is actually less than the lattice energy of MgF2. Okay. All right. I want to go back to this problem because there's that part A that I didn't talk about. I want you to kind of actually uh, go through the same reasoning I just did with part B and think about which of these two would have a higher lattice energy in this case and why. Okay, explain why that is. And this would be part of the questionnaire that I'll attach next to the video. And again, you might actually need to look up distances in this case, specific distances of these uh, ions that are involved in this particular ionic compound. I specifically made this a little ambiguous, so you want to kind of think carefully about which one would you, you know you think would actually have the higher lattice energy. Okay. Now okay, so in this last uh part of this video I just want to give a little intro to the next video where I'm gonna work through uh step by step how to use the Born Harbor cycle to calculate lattice energy. So remember this was the second method I mentioned a couple of slides ago in the previous video to talk to calculate the lattice energy. We just learned how to do use this use the Coulomb's equation to do this. Now we're going to use this Born Harbor cycle. I'm going to do that in the next video. I just want to point out a couple of important things because those are not 
discuss in the next video that's a video i made a few, uh, you know a, a couple a year ago so it's in that video i didn't really discuss uh, things that i want you to know as a introduction to the born harbor cycle the born harbor cycle is basically just like uh, a series of reactions that you need to know because it's a series of known reactions and each of these reactions has associated enthalpies okay so what you're gonna do is use a series of these reactions and their enthalpy values and you're gonna use something that basically has this law to try to solve for the lattice energy of an ionic compound and so you'll see how that's done in the next video what's important for you to get out of from that video is how to write the reactions that are part of the born harbor cycle so you're gonna have reactions that we talked about before ionization energy reaction electron affinity reactions uh, sublimation reactions you know those are concepts or terms that we talked about before you need to know exactly how to write each of those reactions what they mean okay that's very important so you wanna pay close attention to that when I discuss it in the next video the other thing I want to keep in mind is that in that video I actually use a definition of lattice energy that I got from a different textbook where the lattice energy is defined as the energy that's released when we form an ionic bond but in this particular textbook that I'm using right now the lattice energy is defined as the energy that's needed to break ionic bonds so it's exactly the reverse process so you want to keep that in mind in, in this current definition the lattice energy is a positive quantity in the video that you'll see the lattice energy is actually defined as a negative quantity but aside from that it's exactly the same value okay so think about that we'll clarify some of these concepts again when we meet in class okay